Let's uh, turn to Professor Reimer here, and I want to talk a little bit about um, the lingering effects of colonization uh, and the uh, fears about globalization. To what extent uh, is the sort of lingering um, effects of colonization and also sort of global uh, Western power a part of a, how much does it flavor the experience of Christians in Vietnam and Laos and, and also constrain or flavor the responses that are, that are possible uh, to experiences of repression? Uh, let me start first with the uh, Roman Catholic uh, Church in Vietnam. Uh, Catholic uh, communist history, you know, falsely ties it too closely to French colonization, but it appears that they're almost, uh, almost over that. And um, another opposition, even pre-communist, you know, of Vietnamese culture toward Christianity was that it, you know, was foreign. It, it didn't fit into Vietnamese culture. And um, Vietnamese uh, communists interpreted Vatican II's approval of ancestor veneration as virtually ancestor worship. So Catholics are in as far as the, the communists are concerned. Catholic theologians will make a distinction between ancestor veneration and ancestor worship. Um, but because of this, this, the critical size of the Catholic Church and I think also the wise leadership of the, the bishops, you know, post-communism, uh, Catholics have avoided the serious, egregious uh, um, persecution that evangelicals have had, because evangelicals are, again, falsely, in my opinion, you know, tied only to America. Uh, many evangelical fraternal contacts are Asian in Vietnam and uh, also, uh, you know, European and, 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 and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, Vietnam has this concept, uh, a conceptual structure called peaceful evolution. They said, okay, Americans lost the war uh, with guns and bullets, but they're fighting by peaceful evolution, the weapons of which are um, religious freedom, advocacy, and uh, democracy, and human rights. And the vanguard of this peaceful evolution is the fight for religious freedom, and evangelicals are the vanguard. So evangelicals this way are demonized, and uh, this, this conceptual structure uh, dr has driven a lot of persecution of evangelicals. All right, thank you. Um, in the uh, interest of time, I want to uh, give each of the respondents here an opportunity to talk very directly about the responses of Christians in the locations that they've researched. And if I might, I would like them to sort of summarize uh, the kinds of responses in bullet points, just a few words uh, per bullet, bullet point, giving us a, a range of the kinds of responses, the things that Christians have done in response to their situation. And then just to draw out one, that uh, a particularly fascinating response or one that has been particularly effective um, or that you find uh, particularly noteworthy for some other reason and talk about that one. And I want to do this in about a minute each, if possible, uh, and then we're going to get to a period of audience participation. Uh, let's start with Professor Hefner. In one minute, yes. uh, in, the, uh, in the transition to democracy again after the 32 years of authoritarian rule, there were outbreaks of very severe Christian Muslim violence in five of Indonesia's 32 provinces and about 10,000 people died in the worst conflict in Ambo and Maluku, which involved ferocious mobilization on the part of both Christians and Muslims. Some very tough Christians in there, I might add. Very effective in their militias and equally brutal as their opponents in the conflict. This violence, and indeed the, the new situation of democracy, generally uh, was, uh, was greeted with condemnation, of course, by Muslim and Muslim nationalists and Christian leaders in most other parts of uh, Indonesia outside of the conflict zones. And again, they rallied, I know I have to be short here, they rallied once again 
to what is for Indonesia's, Indonesians the sweetest legacy of their engagement with modernity. They don't see it as a Western borrowing. And that is the ideals of multi-confessional, multi-religious nationalism. You want to know a difference between Indonesia and at least some other parts of the Muslim world? It lies there. Tariq Ramadan, I hosted him at Boston four years ago. He's been to Indonesia. The first thing he said to me, he said when we were speaking about Egypt, as opposed to Indonesia, he says, you know, those Indonesians, they're such proud nationalists, and their nationalism extends to Christianity, it also, er, to, to Christians and non-Muslims, and it also extends to rallying to the idea of an indigenized, that is, Panchasila, the five principled, uh, principles, vision of multi-confessional nationalism and multi-confessional citizenship, and that in if you will, appealing to Christians worldwide, that is one of the things that Indonesians appeal to their brothers and sisters in other parts of the world to remember that Indonesia indeed does have, it doesn't need to be told to discover human rights. It has a tradition that it indeed needs to enforce and implement all the more vigorously. Thank you. Professor Zinga? Okay, um, so uh, two basic responses. Institutionally, um, Christian institutions in Pakistan have been part of the country since the, for the formation and continue to do so. So um, there are many Christian organizations, hospitals, the education system is entirely run by, almost entirely run by Christians, particularly Catholics, uh, social working organizations, welfare societies, welfare groups, uh, some of the best hospitals and um, other social institutions are run by Christians. The second thing is political protest. Uh, Christians in Pakistan are not passive, and it's not just the middle class Christians who are in a good position to protest with things in urban centers, but this also happens in rural communities. Christians are very active in what is happening to them and in responding to it. So you might see protests that are small. You might see in a, in a uh, I do most of my work in villages and urban slums, and you might see just a small little protest that occurs in those areas if something has happened, if there's a blasphemy law case, or if something, if a church has been bombed or attacked. Or you might see a full-scale kind of national march that's occurring in front of the uh, courthouse in Lahore or in Islamabad. Um, uh, Christians are, are very active in reaching out to international organizations as well to make sure that they are getting the word out of what their context and what their situation is like. Uh, one interesting thing uh, that uh, I've uh, noticed during this research project is um, something that I'm, I'm calling architectural assertion. And there is a man whose name is Pervez Gill who has just recently built the largest cross in uh, Pakistan. It's actually going to be the largest cross in South Asia, some would say. Um, and it's, uh, it's built in Karachi, which is a very diverse and um, uh, largest city in uh, Pakistan. Um, the cross is, is absolutely huge. It's about 60 stories high. It's like a, a, a you know, very, very tall building. And um, what's uh, kind of funny about it is it's known uh, uh, in the city as the bulletproof cross because it's been reinforced so many times in case some, someone tries to do something to it. Um, so uh, in, in one sense, you know, we have uh, Pakistan, we have this country where we have a Muslim major majority that is uh, allowing and permitting the building of the largest cross in South Asia. On the other hand, it's also bulletproof. So <laughs> we'll see what happens with it. <laughs> There's a symbol in there somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, okay, Professor Panaya. Yeah, so I have just bullet points, nine bullet points. One is the migration, the internal migration as well as the external migration. You migrate from one part of India to the other where you feel safe. So uh, Kandamal, for instance, is the place where Christians got persecuted. The Dalit Christians, they moved to places like uh, Chennai or Bangalore or elsewhere where they felt safe. As a result, uh, Kandamala has become a lot more a Hindu space than uh, you know, it was earlier. Then you have the next response, the camouflaging of Christian identity, because uh, in India, the Dalit Christians are not allowed to change their religion. If they do so, I mean, well, I mean sorry, Dalits, uh, Dalits cannot uh, change out another religion, especially to Christianity or to Islam. If they do so, then they lose their rights, you know, privileges uh, uh, of reservation, etc. Because of that, they keep this dual identity. So this uh, camouflaging of identity uh, that takes place at individual level uh, takes on uh, 
community level or collective level in Sri Lanka. Because the uh, Sri Lankan Buddhist government does not allow, uh, you know, with, I mean, does not have proper policies to recognize the uh, building of the churches. Therefore, people, you know, have house model or they have uh, community buildings and they do it in overnight uh, so that, you know, the, they are not visible easily, uh, so all that. So there are different ways in which they just hide their identity. Um, thirdly, accommodation strategies. Uh, uh, you can speak of cultural accommodation where Christians are, you know, try to partake in the local uh, you know, uh, celebrations of uh, Poya days or Garam festival in India or Pongal, you know, things like that, or, uh, you know, Buddhist New Year, etc. You can speak of cultural, uh, sorry, religious accommodation where there is interfaith uh, funerals, interfaith uh, marriages, interfaith cremations, and uh, uh, Catholics taking part or, you know, uh, providing services to the Buddhists who are going to the uh, Buddhist temple on Vaishak days, things like that. You also have in India uh, 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 iftar party uh, hosted by the Archbishop of Bangalore. You have uh, Sarvadharma Sauha the Kuta in which uh, in Mangalore uh, uh, Catholic, especially the Mangalore Catholic Sabha has uh, this particular thing called interreligious uh, kind of uh, meal in which, you know, on a given day, let's say Christmas or a, on the church festival, feast, they invite everybody, the Christians, Muslims, everyone comes there, they read Quran, they read uh, Bhagavad Gita and they have the meal together. Uh, then you have accommodation evangelical methods. Uh, I think the uh, evangelicals, in, both in India as well as in Sri Lanka, have changed their strategies. They have almost said no to uh, open air preaching. Uh, and uh, you know, in Sri Lanka, for instance, they don't actually uh, arrange any great events on uh, on Poya days because that's a very important sacred day for the Buddhists. So there is a kind of a sensitivity shown on the part of the evangelicals towards uh, towards uh, non Christians. Uh, that also makes it possible for uh, the mainline churches to you know, come closer to evangelicals, you know, because there is a change in the uh, evangelical ways of uh, preaching the gospel. Uh, you, then you can speak of collaboration with uh, non-Christians uh, for interreligious harmony uh, at, the di at the dialogical level, at the uh, uh, social work level, uh, you know, things like that. And you can also speak of uh, Christian commitment to build a civil society, uh, a just a civil society, and Christians' engagement in building uh, the nation of India or Sri Lanka. You know, in various ways, they get involved in the, in the local issues of the people. Uh, thus, uh, they enhance their credibility as the citizens of the country. Uh, then you can also speak of uh, uh, collaboration with non-Christians to heal the wounds of, you know, a conflict, you know, be it uh, ethnic conflict or religious conflict. And they collaborate with, uh, you know, the people of different religious traditions to go to these places, visit them. You have a number of examples. Maybe later on I can talk about it. You have DARC in Sri Lanka, the District Interreligious Committee, which does an excellent job. You have field work. You have blood donation camps organized by, you know, Catholics uh, to go to the single area and uh, uh, the Tamils giving blood to the Sinhalese and Christians giving to Hindus and Hindus to Muslims, etc., etc. And you can speak of uh, Christian exercise of their political uh, subjectivity. So far, the Indian Christians have been very, very, uh, I mean, to a great extent until 1990s, uh, Indian Christians have been very, very politically inactive and indifferent, especially the hierarchy, Christian leadership. Now, I think after the, uh, after the uh, persecution, they are a lot more involved, you know, I'll keep it here. <laughs> yeah, okay. So the, I, hate, I, I hate to cut off uh, what is, in essence, my shared research, because I could talk all day about India and, and Sri Lanka. But uh, let's get to Professor Reimer and then to the audience. Uh, my research uh, for this project uh, confirmed some of the hunches gained during 35 years of religious liberty advocacy in Vietnam and challenged some others. Uh, I was surprised in uh, interviews uh, that of how many uh, evangelical Protestants were actually f forced to leave the faith that actually were so afraid of the consequences of uh, maintaining public worship that they, that they left the faith. Uh, that still happens uh, to this day. That was, a, that was a bit of a surprise finding for me. Uh, otherwise, I would say about uh, Christians in Vietnam that their responses fall very neatly into the three classical biblical responses to persecution. Um, endurance, uh, resistance or fight, and flight. Endurance is the one, of course, that uh, the Book of Acts and the epistles have the most to say about. And in interview after interview with, uh, uh, for this research, when, when asked, when, when Christians are asked, okay, so, uh, so why did you just sort of take it? Uh, they would say, uh, well, first of all, 
they have the power, they have the guns, we really have no choice. But on the other hand, uh, it, it's part of the package. We expect it. When we become Christians, uh, we will suffer. This is, again, particularly true of the ethnic minorities. And uh, they convert knowing full well that they will pay a price. Um, there's much more advocacy going on than um, perhaps I realized. A lot of it falls on deaf ears, but there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of petitions written to Vietnamese authorities uh, with the help of internal advocates appealing for better treatment on, uh, on the basis of Vietnam's own regulations and laws. Most of these are uh, ignored. And then, of course, flight. Uh, people flee persecution. Uh, the most recent martyrdom in Vietnam was March of 2013, and strong advocacy by the family of the murdered, uh, the, the person mur murdered in police custody, um, led first of all to an attempt by the Vietnamese authorities to pay them off, and when that didn't work, they turned to threats. So 29 people, widow, children, brothers, uh, felt they had to flee Vietnam and fled to a neighboring country. Uh, some advocacy works. Some of the best advocates now, internal advocates in Vietnam, are uh, leaders that have spent a lot of time in prison. And they have somehow learned to work with, uh, with authorities. They respectfully engage. Uh, they have to be prepared for some abuse, but uh, they establish relationships, uh, respectful relationships, and are able to accomplish some quite amazing things for the churches they represent. Thank you, and let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists for <laughs> very provocative thoughts and for also keeping us on time and, and uh, let uh, their miserly use of time be a bit of a model here as we get into our uh, question answering uh, a question asking period. So we have some microphones, I think, and we, do we have roving ones also? So we've, we've got roving ones and we've got the ones down here. So, yes. Yes, hello, my name is Heiner Bielefeld. I'm the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. Just a word on Vietnam. I wholeheartedly agree that Vietnam is a highly repressive police state and people suffer serious, grave, systematic violations of freedom of religion or belief. At the same time, I would say, and maybe you can also elaborate a bit on that, that the pattern of violations have changed recently, which is a source of many misunderstandings, especially tourists going there often feel, no problem, there is religion in the country. You see churches, temples, they are open, people worship. I would say the pattern of violation has shifted a little bit from the belief component to the freedom component of freedom of religion or belief. So still we have a one-party system, and one-party systems also always have to work on the assumption, the illusion that the party and the people are identical. So they are typically obsessed with control, control, control. So here, uh, the main pattern is not, not fighting religion in total any longer, but exercising excessive control, instrumentalization, and infiltration. And that leads then to splits within all communities, not only Christian communities, but also the Buddhists, for instance. Independent Buddhist communities, I think, suffer exactly the same pattern of violation as many of the Christian communities. Good. Last word, I mean, the Catholic Church plays a very good role. The Redemptorists in Ho Chi Minh City, they bring together all the independent groups. I can merely, I mean, applaud to what they do. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Bielefeld. Um, as a special rapporteur, he paid a visit to Vietnam a year and a half ago, and uh, though he was hindered in his visit, uh, his exceptionally fine analysis of the situation is of great help to us advocates in Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Julia, Julia Bicknell. Um, I left the BBC after about 30 years as a journalist in the World Service to focus on reporting what is happening to Christians around the world, and I've spent the last three years on that. When I was in the BBC, I spent a year in Pakistan as a BBC reporter from that country, so I know it quite well. 
Um, now, it seems to me with the blasphemy laws that um, the government has, or perhaps not so much the government, but the judiciary, the Supreme Court, has basically acknowledged that the blasphemy law is often misused, and particularly um, recent examples such as you gave have proved that case to the international community. As I understand it, the judiciary have basically challenged the um, Pakistani parliament to go away and change the law. And if they do that, then they can implement that through the, through the judicial system. What I'm asking is what would you like us as the international community to do to influence the Pakistan parliament in some way to make some amendments to this blasphemy law? Thank you. And actually, Professor Singh, we'd like to hear from you, but we also want to hear from Dr. Yeah. Bhatti in response. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, as it concerns about the blasphemy, the recent verdict of the Supreme Court is very encouraging. But next to that, I would like to share with you, until now, the history of Pakistan. Nobody is executed, nobody is punished for the blasphemy law in the court of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So judiciary was never in favor to Islam, basically, morally. And next to that, there was a opinion that anybody from the extremist or from the uh, fanatics, anybody who favors, who is blasphemer, he is doing the same, I mean, it's blasphemy. So the court has cleared very much that this law is not from the holy book. Mm. This law is made by the men. So any law made by the men is completely can be discussed. So this is very encouraging. But next to that, my concern is that it is not the blasphemy which is going to harm the country or the Christian or Muslim community who are the I mean, innocent victim of that. There is a specific ideology. If you see the background of the people who are accused, they are killed before they reach the court, before the accusation is filed. So we have to change that mindset. Even if we change the law of blasphemy, I think if we don't change the mindset, we don't change uh, flourishing that, uh, I mean, a group of people who are imposing this radical philosophy will then change. So we have to promote education. Just to add to that, I mean, that's the real problem. We have feudalism, tribalism, and lack of education, and that's what's causing a lot of these issues. So when you have blasphemy, false accusations, most of the stuff is taking place outside of the judiciary system. Um, and f as far as the international community, I think, you know, keeping it nuanced, keeping, keeping eye on the fact that there are many Muslims who are also accused of blasphemy, especially Ahmadis, uh, Shias, uh, women, uh, sometimes, especially in uh, rural areas, women who are wrongly accused or, or you know, there's some, uh, some personal issue there. Mm -hmm. Blasphemy is used in that sense. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is about two years ago, there has been a bla blasphemy in Pakistan, first of all, is supposed to be used for any religion. Uh, it has generally not gone that way, but it is, it is supposed to be. So if, you, uh, if you're Muslim and you say something that is blasphemous against uh, Jesus, for example, who is a prophet in Islam, it can be used against you as well for that reason. But two years ago, there was a case in, um, in Sindh province um, of uh, uh, a Hindu temple that was destroyed, and um, uh, the three Hindus brought a case of blasphemy against Muslims, and it has been registered with the court. Now, I don't think it'll really go anywhere, but the fact that it has been registered is something. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, seeing no other questions lined up, I want to just expand the... T oh, sorry. We, you, I didn't see you sitting there. Sorry. Go ahead. Come on. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for sharing your experience. It's such a gift for us. Uh, my name is Rob McCallum. Uh, I work primarily doing social development work. Um, I would love to hear from any of you. Uh, if you've noticed elements in community that make it susceptible to conflict, and if you have insight on how we can invest in community to make it more resilient to conflict. Mm -hmm. all right. Anybody like to answer? Uh, this is, of course, uh, an issue with which uh, conflict analysis, peace, and reconciliation scholars have been struggling for the better part of the century and with special vigor, I think, over the last 15 years. Uh, in the 1990s, we all know uh, that the general faith was put in this mysterious thing called civil society, and we now know that was much too simple. That it's, it's a very complex, so it, it's, it's not just investment in society, it's investment in 
collaborations across the state society divide, just to, to cite the standard aphorism, but I think it's a very important one. You can have a, uh, a good civil society, as I think, if I may again, in Indonesia, I haven't spoken about Muhammadiyah and Nahdlatul Ulama and the great things that they did, but you can have a, a relatively strong and healthy and vigorous civil society, but if you have a state and or actors working in alliance with the state who simply act in defiance of those potential resources, you can do great damage. So it's collaboration across the state society divide. For that, you need, yes, resources and society. Above all, indigenous resources be both normative, normative work, as well as social organizational that can be scaled up and then linked to forces in society that rather than being uncivil and exploitative of divisions, uh, uh, divide and conquer sort of divide and rule arrangements, rather than working against those civil forces, work with them to create a kind of creative synergy. Thank you.